Well, hello folks, nice to see you. I was trying to make a video over the last week and kept flubbing it. So the first time I went to my view spot because I wanted to show you all what a Sahara dust storm looks like in Portugal. And I well, this is gonna suck pretty much because I forgot to bring the mic. And so here, here I go again. But I feel compelled to share this with you, so I'm gonna try a third time, and maybe third time is lucky. We'll see. Anyhow, uh, I was reading Jamie Wheel the other day, and he had this nice little model that he made. Uh, you know, something that consultants like Jamie will do is take old stuff and, and put them together in a new way, a novel way and uh, hopefully that's helpful in some sense. So this is a triangle. It involves Pascal's wager, Occam's razor, and Bayesian probability uh, theory. Uh, so, um, you know Pascal's wager, right? You might as well believe in God because what if there is a hell? What if there is a heaven? And Occam's razor, uh, you know, usually the simplest explanation is correct. Why complicate things? And then Bayesian probabilities, you're looking at um, updating your priors, you know, in light of new information and evidence, you update your worldview or your model or your theory or your understanding of something or another. And you put these three frames together and it's a nice uh, thing to have in your bullshit detector kit or your critical thinking tool kit. And I think that's a kind of a nice way to look at it. You can think about that. It's nothing new, but uh, I think it's useful. So anyway, we're all very easily manipulated. Uh, all of us are. Uh, whatever we're paying attention to or forced to pay attention to, and in some sense we're all born in a place and a time and we can't avoid what we're Pay, paying attention to because it's what we've got. Um, you know, it will affect our thinking, our belief, our beliefs, and all of that. So, uh, I was a friend of mine sent me a video from a YouTuber who looks like he's he was in the Navy. He's thirty something, I guess, and he was pointing out that TikTok is this horrific weapon that the Chinese have unleashed on America, kind of like fentanyl. I don't know why anyone in America wants to do fentanyl, but they do and they get it from some sources in Mexico and China and so on. So it's all their fault. But anyway, that's typical. Um, none of it has anything to do with our behavior or beliefs. Uh, it, it all has to do with some outside other, you know, the us and them, some scapegoat, you know, it's what they're doing to us that, that matters. Anyhow, um, he pointed out, well, he referenced this young woman's TikTok video. Uh, she's probably in her early 20s and she was upset and emotional and she was triggered because she saw some Hasidic Jews on the Brooklyn subway or something like that. And it upset her because she doesn't like what's happening in Gaza. Go figure. I mean, some people really don't like what's happening in Gaza. And uh, it's understandable, I think. But anyway, so she was triggered by that. So his point was uh, she probably was brainwashed, manipulated, or radicalized by other TikTok videos. And that's why she thinks Gaza is a hot mess of evil. Um, you know, for some people, uh, for example, libertarians, they think if you just leave me free to do whatever the heck I want, the whole wide world's going to be perfect. Well, it'll be perfect for them. Fuck everybody else, right? So sometimes I can't stand radical libertarians. I'm not saying this YouTuber is one. I don't know him at all, really. But um, the idea is that People who don't think like you are radicalized by something, you know, neo-Marxism or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they're crazy, you know, they, they, they consume disinformation and they don't know how to think and so on and so forth. So this is pretty typical of human beings. He made a point about 
human history uh, being about conquest, which is true, uh, but knowing that everybody everywhere has engaged in conquest doesn't excuse or uh, blot out colonialism or how empires work. I mean, colonialism is a thing, and it, it was a thing way before wokeism was around. So, you know, let's be fair, let's examine these things uh, in their contexts and try to understand what they are. And then maybe we can do something with our understanding. So uh, another thing I was looking at, uh, I was listening to a podcast, Citations uh, Needed, which is over on the computer behind me here. Uh, they kind of critique media, and I think they're very good at doing that. And it was about cry bullyism. The recent episode, I didn't even know what that was, cry bullyism, but it's pretty cool. So it's just the idea that people with a lot more power than you uh, who are oppressing you or abusing you in some way, when you point that out to them and say, I really don't like this abuse and oppression, uh, they get hurt, you know, they feel endangered. So it's, it's kind of like, the safe space thing, but for billionaires, right? So um, the whole thing is crazy, which is why I want to share with you an article uh, by uh, a guy I follow, uh, Indika. He's a Buddhist Sri Lankan living in Sri Lanka with his Christian wife. He has a couple kids. He obviously spent a lot of time in the States. Um, his thinking is the closest to my thinking in terms of a real politic, you know, global world view. Uh, he uses white empire a lot. I, I would say we could dispense with the white, but it's a good metaphor in, in terms of uh, interrogating European colonialism and things like that, American empire. Uh, but, you know, some, somebody else might, might well have, have tipped the scales way back when in an alternate universe and we'd be talking about, you know, yellow empire or whatever. But I don't think race is, a, is necessarily the best uh, uh, envelope to put things in because we can, we can just as easily look at human nature and, you know, how our minds work our bodies work, our societies work. You know, we can look across domains of human, hum, human, of the, we can look across domains of, of the humanities and kind of interrogate all of that. But it's okay, you know, if you want to couch it in those terms, I don't care. Um, anyway, he's talking about the conservative agenda for when Trump wins the election. So I'm going to share that article with you. I think he's very insightful uh, in a lot of ways. It, it's not going to make you happy, especially if you're an American or a European, to read his point of view, because he's very critical of our project. But there are things to be valued in Western civilization, uh, obviously. The good and evil part is kind of ubiquitous, good and evil, you know, and they kind of exist, coexist, and we can either uh, try to work towards the better angels or we can... Well, hello everybody. So here I am at the article I was talking about. And um, so, he says, I read Trump's transition plan so you don't have to, part one. I'm really looking forward to part two, I have to say. So anyway, I like Indy.ca. He's a great guy. Uh, a lot of people will probably hate him because he's kind of a brutal critic of where we are right now. <laughs> so uh, if you're faint of heart or if you're sensitive, it, it might not be your cup of tea. So that's a trigger warning. Um, so yeah, 
So the plan, I downloaded that a while ago. The Heritage Foundation uh, produced it. And it's, you know, the original mandate was for Ronald Reagan in 81. So Republicans love to hearken back to Ronald Reagan because he was the best thing since sliced bread. And apparently (laughs) he still is. So anyway, uh, yeah, he talks about the victory for Reagan and rails against the ruling and cultural elite today. But uh, Indy sees it as intra-elite competition. So the Republican elites are just the same side of the imperial coin, often going to the same elite universities. So it's so funny that all these anti-elitists are actually elitists. (laughs) So I just find that hilarious. And it's so true. Um, They all go to the same schools. So the next administration must not cede such authority to nonpartisan experts who pursue their own ends while engaging in groupthink insulated from American voters. But that is, of course, talking about those experts, not these experts. So, yeah, it's like the libertarian thing. I want to be free to do what I want to do, and and you can't be free to do what you want to do because it impinges on my freedom to do what I want to do. So you can't have government because there'll be rules. But you can have a rules-based order because it's my rules. Anyway... So, yeah, my experts over your experts, nobody kind of sees the hypocrisy or the contradictions. They they just don't get it because everyone loves the people they follow and pay attention to. So under the Constitution, they're the mere equals of the workers who shower after work instead of before, as if all of these uh, Republican Congress people don't shower before they go to work and not after. You know, none of these people are rolling up their sleeves to go to the factory. We sent all the factories to Mexico and Vietnam and China a long time ago. So, you know, advocating this is ridiculous. And when you advocate for the oil and fossil fuels industry, you're just advocating for, you know, an order that's been around for a while that everybody (laughs) depends on. so it's like, yeah, give, I mean, Trump and coal, that was hilarious. So anyway, but under our Constitution, yeah, yeah. Um, this comes right after pages listing their own pedigrees. Oxford, Harvard, the Wall Street Journal, fancy law firms, etc. It's like their own sense of identity is based on superiority over Europeans. <laughs> I... I make the quip all the time. Why? Because you're a peon, you know, a petty little nothing, a peon. Well, it seems to me like uh, Europe does whatever America tells them to do anyway, so you're a peon. So he goes through the introduction here. I won't do what read through all of this, but it's all pretty damn good. But there there are some real gems in this piece. To be honest, these are actually the same practices as the Democratic Party, just shorn of hypocrisy and diversity. The morals they do not possess are different, and the state enemies are shuffled. But again, this is intra-elite competition, not a game-changer in any way. In 1979, quote, the threats we faced were the Soviet Union, the socialism of the 1970s, liberals, and the predatory deviancy of cultural elites. Reagan defeated these beasts by ignoring their tentacles and striking instead at their hearts. And then this is a great point. This begs the question, if these beasts were defeated, why are you still fighting them? (laughs) So I've noticed that for decades. We're always fighting the same battles, we just shuffle it around. And, you know, it's like, well, if you're, if you're so good, why are we in this hot shit mess? 
if Western civilization is so perfect, why do we have any problems? We, we could just say, hey, it is the end of history and let's just relax and enjoy it. So the old wine in new bottles is about commies again. This, is, this time it's the Chinese. So then there's the new incarnation of 1970s liberals as the totalitarian cult known today as the Great Awakening. So you have the uh, Great Reset and, oh, and wokeism and so on, and, and you're pointing your finger at that, at that nowadays. And, you know, there is no reset. It's just the same shit in you know, couched in different terminology and rhetoric. Uh, what's reset about anything? Nothing. What, what will reset things is a nuclear war or, you know, the consequences of, of global heating, but we can't talk about that. Climate denialism is strong in the world still, and so is science de denialism. It just doesn't go anywhere. So the enemy, whoever it is, is both pathetically weak and terrifyingly strong at the same time. And I'm always talking about that. You got these supervillains, Putler and Xi Jinping and, you know, Islam and so on. And they, they c cause all the problems in the world. But they're weak and they're stupid and irrational and idiotic. But, but they're super powerful at the same time, right? You can see the contradiction there. It's kind of re insanely ridiculous. So despite Republicans being president nearly half of the time since Reagan, the country is almost completely fucked. Quote, the countries where Marxist elites have won political and economic power are all weaker, poorer, and less free for it. But at the same time, quote, China is, by any me measure, the most powerful state in the world other than the United States itself, the document says. So on one hand, they're weak and, and they don't, they're not free, just like the poor girl who's triggered by Gaza. Uh, she has no agency. She has no brain. She's a weak, you know, manipulated, uh, radicalized kid. Uh, and at the same time, they're powerful. You know, the woke, the woke mob is coming for you and they're going to get you. They're going to take your guns and make you have abortions. So, quote, there's no such thing as the government. There are just people who work for the government and wield its power and who, at almost every opportunity, wield it to serve themselves first and everyone else a distant second. So he says, well, it's literally a governmental agenda written by people that want to get government jobs. So look at the mad hypocrisy here that nobody seems to see. So I don't like the government, but I want to be in the government. I want to be the government. It's just got to be the government that I like. You know, it's the libertarian thing. I want to be free to do what I want to do and fuck everybody else. So it's just us versus them all over again, you know, nothing really changes. International organizations and agreements that erode our constitution, rule of law, or popular sovereignty should not be reformed. They should be abandoned. Illegal immigration should be ended, not mitigated. The border sealed, not reprioritized. Economic engagement with China should be ended not rethought. America's vast reserves of oil and natural gas are not an environmental problem. They are the lifeblood of economic growth. Well, a certain kind of economic growth that, that's probably going to get everybody killed. It's like the Venusification of the world. But we, we're not going to see it that way. <laughs> we can't engage the science. It's too much for us. So he says, now bear in mind, this is all the stuff that Biden is doing, just more hypocritically. So his thesis is that uh, one side comes out and just tells you what they're doing and it is unashamed about it, and the other side tries to pretend like they're these virtuous hand-wringers, do-gooders, but they're doing the same evil, basically. 
So the difference is that Biden puts colored people and women in front of him to do it. They're literally just doing the same meme. Conservatives are at least refreshing in the way they say, fuck it, we're evil, deal with it. Or as Roberts describes, described Reagan's Cold War policy, we win, they lose. Us and them pervades this document constantly. You could say it's the unifying creed. The blame game, right? Robert says, China is a totalitarian enemy of the United States, not a strategic partner or fair competitor. But like how? They never talk about how they are like that. They literally can't bomb China because the bomb parts are made in China. I've mentioned this over and over again. It just seems so intuitive to me, having done business in China for over a, you know, uh, a decade. I mean, I was in mainland China and Hong Kong for a long time. And, uh, you know, I was working on the behest of American corporations over there. Everybody was making their eyeglasses over there, making their car parts over there, you know, because of labor arbitrage, because it was cheaper to do it, more efficient, as it were. And you could export cheap shit to Walmart and everybody was happy as long as they had enough money to go to the big box store with and yet somehow it's all the Chinese fault for giving us what we wanted and for uh, the technology transfer that we agreed to and so on and so forth. You know, it's so ridiculous. I, but people just don't get it and, and they can't get it because they're just not looking at things with the full critical thinking toolkit. So hence when America says threat they mean someone who isn't sufficiently threatened by them. This is not hypocrisy. This is hegemony. So again, I've said that, you know, if everybody doesn't want to be Americans, then we're going to kill you. You know, you pay up, pay tribute up to the boss or, or you're in trouble. We're going to burn your store down, all the good fellas. So pivot to Asia. This is an old thing. In a war games in war games and these are published by defense experts and the pentagon you can read them america wouldn't have survived more than a few weeks of high intensity expeditionary war right where you go out to another place and fight and now they're uh they've blown most of their ammo in ukraine and they're even sending ammo that could be used in Ukraine to Israel so they can bomb Gaza. So he says, it's hard to see how an American, uh, sorry, an army that's been defeated by the Taliban and a navy defeated by Yemen pivots anywhere. But American presidents keep vainly writing checks their asses can't cash. Hence, both elites are in a race, racist race to scapegoat somebody. So that's typical. It's always like that. The barbarians are the outsiders. Your, 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 your insiders are civilized pe people that God loves. And it's always been like that. So can we ever change it? I don't know. So he says, Republicans blame China and migrants. And it's really just a matter of degree. What Republicans seem to be trying to do here is construct a stabbed in the back narrative a la Nazi Germany, blaming Americans, declining life expectancy and finances on China. So there you go. Uh, when you other, when you play this game, it, it, it's, it's like the Nazis, you know, in the 30s, blaming everybody else for their problems and then, you know, taking it to the battlefield. So basically the people making their stuff and feeding them and not the corporations making the actual decisions, regardless of administration. And you have to wonder, you know, who the donors are and so on and so forth. You know, corporations aren't inherently bad, but, you know, uh, they have their interests and their interests include, you know, their business interests and not anything else. So if if our politicians are working basically for them, they're working for business interests, not for yours, you know, citizens, what is that, you know? 
um, there are only individuals. You know, you get rid of the commons, get rid of government, the whole thing, and, and let the corporations take over, or the big fat cat corporate king who manages everything for whose benefit? So the fact that Trump, he says, the fact that Trump and his children had a liberal New York education and that Trump probably had an open account at abortion clinics is irrelevant. It's all a game. And the name of the game is blaming the blame game. So what to cut? This documentary is deeply thin on actual solutions for actual problems because the deep assumptions is that it's not their problem. It's China's problem. It's migrants' problem. It's those elites' problem. Just hit them hard enough and everybody should be peachy. So yeah, you don't have anyone to pick the peaches, but if you kill all the pe peach pickers, you're going to be fine. So... Uh, quote, cultural institutions like public libraries and public health agencies gotta go. So cutting, he says, cutting libraries and public health is like trying to lose weight by cutting out the tomato and lettuce and still having a big, a big double patty of human flesh on a Raytheon bun. He has a way with words. <laughs> so <laughs> a big patty of human flesh on a Raytheon bun especially at late stage rent-seeking capitalism. So there's a, you know, you have to look at, at what you mean by capitalism and what phase we're in in this whole project. And <clears throat> now it's the rent-seeking that's the big deal. So you will have nothing, you will own nothing and pay through the nose for it with your micropayments 24-7. Anyway, however, the intro does say the next president should crack down on the crony capitalist corruption that enables America's largest corporations to profit through political influence rather than competitive enterprise and customer satisfaction. And he says, but then who founded this 22 million project and who feeds the fleas in between administrations? They're obviously not talking about those crony capitalists. That's mandem. The central thesis of this document is still us versus them always. So there you go. Uh, we don't have any corporations backing us. Trump isn't a billionaire businessman who only has his own interests at heart. <laughs> you know, it's so crazy. But this is how people think these days. And it's so easy to think because, as our YouTuber pointed out, you know, you're watching social media, so you're being brainwashed and radicalized, you know, because you don't have critical thinking skills, because you don't, can't do the math, because you don't understand the science paper, because you don't want to. There's a strategic ig ignorance there. And that, that's another podcast episode from... Um, citations needed that I really liked and you should probably check out at some point where they're talking about effective altruism and that whole thing so anyway what not to cut what they they re Trump want to cut is social services public education DEI initiatives basically all the lipstick on the pig so these conservatives somewhat analogously to Russia here, want to take the real politic view of just leaning into fossil fuels, Roberts says. The next conservative president should go beyond merely defending America's energy interests, but go on offense, ass uh, asserting them around the world. America's vast reserves of oil and natural gas are not an environmental problem. They are the lifeblood of economic growth. American dominance of the global energy market would be a good thing for the world and, more importantly, for we the people. And I don't know, if you can't think your, your way around this, then you are one of the ignorati, somebody who just doesn't want to know, doesn't want to learn. 
doesn't want to update their priors, doesn't want to um, employ Occam's razor, and doesn't want to believe that some maybe aliens do exist. I don't know. I, but if the evidence came up, I might go there, so I might as well keep an open mind. So anyway, Biden pretends to care about climate change, but has actually drilled and fracked more than anyone before, the same as Obama proudly did before. There is no political payoff or actual cutting fossil fuels, and there is no cost to just lying about it, which is what Democrats do. So you're not going to bite the hand that feeds you, especially if you're a politician. So anyway, it's a non-renewable resource that we're just running out of. He's talking about fossil fuels. Well, it is true. We don't know when we're going to run out, but at some point we will. And the consequences for burning all of it, it, it will be dire, but you don't want to know the science on that. So you can just go watch a movie like Climate, the movie, which is just rehashed bullshit from another movie made after uh, the convenient truth was made back, you know, uh, how many years ago now? 2000, whatever. So what's the point of reindustrialization this document discusses, right? It's a non-renewable resource. Anyway, America simply doesn't have the natural or human resources for another economic boom. Even if they did, the planet would just explode even faster. That's what, what I'm talking about with uh, accelerationism. We just want to, you know, consume more, 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 more uh, as fast as possible and use more and more energy. And somehow, miraculously, we'll have our replicators uh, in, in the near future and we'll be able to turn, you know, electrons and neutrons or whatever into cheeseburgers anytime we want them or something like that or mine asteroids or and we want to go and terraform mars <laughs> you know if we can't be good stewards of our own habitat then what, what are we going to do and you know it's always been like this human beings are human beings but we have the ability to understand things better and to make better decisions, and we still don't do it. So this rerun strategy is akin to saving the Titanic by laying on more steam. While most of the engine room is dead, or would rather be YouTubers. <laughs> so, oops. Uh, so, yeah, I talk about the bullet train going to a Himalayan-sized granite wall and we're just going faster and faster every nanosecond we can't wait to get there and, and vaporize you know the French want to go into Ukraine once they're in Ukraine they're fair game and so they will be blown up but so what you know we got to have an excuse to have a all out you know war between Russia and its allies and, and NATO it's just something for some reason we want to do and we think it's going to make the world a better place. I think it's ridiculously absurd, but you know, if you look at things uh, from various points of view, if you read your enemies, then you're uh, considered to be a traitor, right? All, you, all I want to do is know what's really going on in the world. So uh, Roberts correctly identifies the actual problem of climate collapse which is philosophical humanism, or what Dr. Tom Murphy calls human supremacy. And that's what we have. And you know, John Locke came from some tradition, and you know, the idea is that we're the top, the, you know, God's gift made in God's image, we can do whatever the hell we want. But the truth is we're dependent on nature, and we're part and parcel of nature we are of we are natural and we we require all the the bugs in our body and all all the viruses and all the microbes and all the other animals and plants and the whale shit to survive and it, if we think we we can do it all on our own we're we're, we're just stupid so 
Industrial civilization has no reverse gear. I would agree with that. I mean, we're just not going to go back. Nobody's going to give up anything to be uh, sustainable. We're, we're not going to do it. You know, nobody wants to give up anything. So much less have an imagination as to what comes next, you know. Figuring that out. We're going to solve problems using the same thinking, that, that old um, quote. Like in Jamie Wheel's uh, thing, he quoted uh, Carl Sagan, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's a paraphrase. And then the Freudian quote, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> so, yeah, but we got to come up with some new ideas and implement them. But we won't, I guarantee that. These guys are focused on a change of administration and going back to the 1980s because American culture is actually dead and has to, re and has to reboot everything. So, yeah, so we're hearkening back. And as I've said over the years, you know, I, I read about the end of conservatism and the end of the Western civilization, all that. The, these books go back to the, you know, 18th century. I mean, they go back forever. <laughs> you know, it's always the end. Um, and people are always fighting over stuff. You know, 1527, the sack of Rome. You know, the, you've got all these principalities going at each other and just committing the most horrific atrocities in the name of religion or in the name of their prince. And that leads to the religious wars the Thirty Years' War, which was a horrific thing. And uh, that's all in Europe, folks. So, you know. Um, and yet, we're the good guys. We're never the bad guys. So, uh, yeah, the limits of growth, the, you know, Club of Rome and all that. I mean, this goes way back. We knew what was coming in terms of the climate science a long time ago, but, you know, we don't do anything. So uh, the limits of growth had come out predicting collapse by about the 2020s if people didn't change dramatically. The Reagan revolution was effectively a counter-revolution against all this. So please, you know, Thatcher and Reagan, don't, don't tell me we can't do what we want to do, you know. So... He mentions Fukuyama, everybody. Fukuyama called this the end of history, and it was because Western civilization honestly ended then, when the Berlin Wall went down. So uh, they're just hearkening back to the douchebags of the past, like that will cleanse everything. So this document is fascinating, and I won't even call it fascist. The truth is that the Nazis took notes from America. Project 2025 is just the American project shorn of hypocrisy. I haven't even gotten to the demonization and brutalization of an entire category of illegal people that defines much of Project 2025. This is just one, this is just the intro. Wait till you see where it leads. So. He read that document so you don't have to. I think he's got a good bead on the meaning of it all. I read the document too, and oh my God. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for bearing with me. Bully MT, out. <laughs>